Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are visiting with us, a special welcome to you. We consider a privilege that you would choose to join us in worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. The mission of Gospel Life is to invite those around us to embrace the good news of Jesus in all of life. And we seek to live out that mission by demonstrating many of our values. And one of the values I want to share with you this morning that we value at Gospel Life is the authority of scriptures, the authority of the scriptures, which means we believe that the scriptures is the final source of truth and doctrine. And we seek to submit to the authority of scriptures in every area of our life because we believe the scriptures are exactly what Jesus and his apostles taught the scriptures were, which is the very words of God. And so we seek to display this value in how we handle the scriptures on Sunday morning, in how we handle the scriptures in our small groups, our gospel communities, and how we use the scriptures to exhort, encourage, rebuke, and admonish one another in our day-to-day -day lives. That's what we mean when we say we value the authority of scriptures. As we begin this morning, uh, would you stand with me, if you're able, for the reading of God's word? Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 138, which says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Will you pray with me? Father, it is good to gather and to corporately give thanks to you. I pray we would give thanks with our whole heart. Will you remind your people, O God, of your steadfast love and your faithfulness? that it was your love that called us to Christ, and it is your faithfulness that keeps us in Christ. It is right and good that we would exalt your name and your word above all things. May we keep this truth in mind that your name is higher than we can imagine, and your word is more valuable than all the riches of the world. And we have the joy and honor to hear from your word and to join you in the exaltation of your name. I pray you would comfort the downcast this morning. Would you give us all faith to believe that you will preserve our life and fulfill the purpose you have for us? And we ask that you would not forsake the work of your hands and that you would use the good works that we do this day to accomplish your will in our life and in the lives of those around us. If anyone here or listening at home is caught in sin or attempting to ignore your spirit, may you restore in them a heart of worship and praise and joy so that they might exchange the fleeting pleasures of this world for treasure that will endure forever. I pray that you would grant repentance and faith for us to believe and apply what your word will teach us today. Would you grant us patience and hope knowing that your way is always the best way and that your timing is always the best timing. For we know that your strength will allow us to endure any trial that you have us walk through. And so as we consider these things, God, I pray that we would grow in our love for you, knowing that we love you because you first loved us. And I pray this service, what happens here, is pleasing to you and brings glory to your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
For he is the one who died the death that we deserved, and he won the victory that we could not win. And in him, we, you have given us eternal life. You have adopted us into your family. You have promised a home in heaven. And you have given us a relationship with you and with Christ that will last forever. This is why we come to worship you, Father. This is why we come to worship you, Christ. And I pray that the words of our mouth now and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us continue to stand and sing and worship. Christian, you have been redeemed. Amen. Redeemed from darkness and despair into life. Redeemed to know Christ and to live with him in eternity. Will you celebrate with us this morning the glorious day when he called your name? You were chosen and he spoke your name and you came to life. Amen, church? Let's celebrate that this morning. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. Your freedom is all that I know. Testimony Church. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. You 
love, for your mercy. Thank you for saving us. And thank you that you didn't just leave us. You change us and you make us more like yourself. You rescue us and you hold us. We thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Because I am 
in that victory, Jesus, because of you and the finished work on the cross. You defeated sin, you defeated death. We don't deserve this victory, but we celebrate it. You have adopted us. You have allowed victory for us. And we worship you this morning. We glorify, we love you. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is a joy, as always, to be with you this morning, uh, to see you all here. My name is Tyler. I am one of the pastors here. And if I've not met you yet, if this is your first Sunday here, or maybe you've been coming for a little bit, but we haven't had a conversation, feel free to come up after the service. I would love to meet you and chat with you. Um, also, in addition to that, Pastor Jonathan and myself will be up here after the service to pray for you. Uh, we want to always make ourselves available to uh, pray for the things that the Lord is teaching you, the, the things that you may be going through. We want to be here for you to uh, lift those things up before Christ together. So uh, don't be shy. Come up after the serv- service if uh, the Spirit leads. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of First Timothy. First Timothy, that's in your, the New Testament. As I said last week, it's right before Second Timothy, if that helps. We began this series last week through the pastoral epistles, and as I said, it's probably going to take us about, I estimated, about 38, we'll just call it 40 weeks, uh, to get through these three letters. These three letters that Paul wrote to fellow co-laborers in the gospel, both Timothy and Titus. And so we're going to be looking at those this year, starting with this first letter to Timothy. As I mentioned last week, the pastoral epistles, and 1 Timothy in particular, they are called the pastoral epistles because they relate directly and they are instructive for those who are currently serving in pastoral ministry, those who want to serve in pastoral ministry. But as we mentioned last week, even if you don't find yourself in one of those categories, this letter, these three letters are beneficial to every Christian. These letters are beneficial to every Christian who is a committed participant in a local church. And as we said last week, that should be Every Christian who should be committed to a local expression of the body of Christ. As we saw last week, Paul gives his purpose statement for this letter in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, where Paul, writing to Timothy, says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that, and that's really helpful, right? He's telling us, I'm writing these things so that. You don't have to guess. I'm writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This letter deals with how we should behave within the local church, how we should interact with one another, what our mission is as the church, what we should expect out of our leaders and what our leaders, how our leaders should conduct themselves. The local church, we see, is a pillar and buttress of the truth, which we will see is relevant for our text today. And some asked me last week, they said, hey, I had to Google the word buttress, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh, So what is that, right? This is an architectural term talking about something that supports or holds up the truth. And so we're going to see that this mission of the church, this purpose of the church is relevant to our text today. This letter was written to Timothy in particular, but it was written for the benefit of the whole congregation in Ephesus. We saw last week that this letter, while written to Timothy, was certainly read in the context of the congregation there in Ephesus, and so we do well, and they did well, and we would do well to hear this as God's Word to us. God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down by Paul, meant for us who seek to conduct ourselves within this household of faith. And so if you're able, let me invite you to stand with me. Today we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, picking up where we left off. We covered the first two verses last week. We're going to look at verses 3 through 7. 
the Holy Spirit says through Paul to us this morning. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving this letter for us. We thank you that this is not just a personal letter to, from Paul to Timothy. It is that. It's not even just a, a letter that was meant for the church in Ephesus. This is your word to us, your people. So Lord, I pray as we seek to glorify you, as we interact with one another in this household of faith, Lord, would we be those who value the truth of the gospel, who uphold the truth of the gospel, who support and contend for the truth of the gospel, and would you give us wisdom to recognize those things that are contrary to the gospel that you've given us. Lord, I pray this morning that we might find a sincere faith in you within our hearts. This is a gift that comes from you. But Lord, I pray that we would trust in you fully for a pure heart, for a cleansed conscience, Lord, we know all these things come as a gift of your grace, mercy, and peace. And so we trust you for these things and with these things. Be with us now as we look at your word. Speak to it. Speak to our hearts through it. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We see in verse 3, Paul again writing to Timothy, but again for the benefit of the congregation at large there in Ephesus, he reiterates the historical situation. We see, he says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So Timothy knows this, but he's reiterating this for the benefit of the congregation and, and to, for our benefit as well. Paul is reminding Timothy of the historical situation of his encouragement to remain in Ephesus and then he reminds him of his mission there at the church in Ephesus, that he might charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. This is the charge. We're going to look at the charge, we're going to look at the opponents, and then we're going to look at the way we can guard ourselves against error. First, the charge. The charge that Paul gives to Timothy. And the charge that Timothy is to give to certain persons, as they're called, within the church in Ephesus. He is to charge certain persons to stop teaching a false gospel. And remember in the introduction, Paul alludes to the true gospel. The true gospel that comes from God our Savior. The true gospel that gives us our hope that is in Jesus. The true gospel that is a gift from God that is a result of His grace, mercy, that gives us peace with God. This true gospel that rests on the work of Christ, his perfect life, his death in the place of sinners, and his victorious resurrection. This is the true gospel. And Paul is telling Timothy to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. We see him refer to these false teachers as certain persons. He, we see Paul doing something that he's done a few times. He seems to be... be Throwing a little bit of shade here, right? This is, again, read in the congregation, and these folks are certainly there, and Paul knows who they are, Timothy knows who they are, and these folks certainly know that Paul knows who they are. And so he's saying these certain persons, they need to be corrected, and he doesn't mind calling them out in front of the congregation. Now, who are they? We're not exactly sure. They seem to be, many have speculated, that they seem to be leaders. Perhaps they're even elders in the church. They certainly have some kind of teaching influence within the church in Ephesus. This is why I think we see an emphasis in 1 Timothy and in Titus on 
the qualifications for true elders. The reason that Paul gives Timothy qualifications to install elders is the qualifications he lists are in counter to these that are teaching falsehoods and behaving in a way that is not fitting for those who lead the church of God. So who are they? Perhaps they are elders. They certainly seem to be those who have a teaching responsibility. We see that Paul, in his ministry in Ephesus, predicted these things. This is in Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 28. This is Paul when he was departing Ephesus. He gives this charge to the elders there at that church. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which was obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from you, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul predicted that in this church there would be those who come to power who would teach what he calls twisted things. So what are these twisted things? What are these different doctrines as we see back in 1 Timothy chapter 3? Well, this word for different doctrine, it's a unique word. It's heterodidaskalin. This is a word that it seems Paul coined or made up. It exists here. It's, it, we only find it in 1 Timothy. What does it mean? Well, he uses this word in one other place. It's in 1 Timothy as well. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, where Paul writes this. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, that's that same word, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. And we'll finish that thought here in a moment, but what we see here is different doctrine is that doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of Jesus. It does not agree with the teaching that accords with godliness. The teaching that we saw last week that Jesus revealed to his, the apostles who were sent out, who were led into all truth, who were given remembrance of all the things that Jesus had taught and were tasked to found the church and to write Scripture This different doctrine, it does not accord with the words of Jesus and the words of his apostles. We see here that there is, even at this early stage, an established orthodoxy built on the words of Christ and the words of his apostles. And these false teachers are teaching something different than that. We can apply this in our own lives as we consider Paul's warning here. This is a warning to us against those who come up with new novel interpretations of Scripture. We see even at this time, there was an orthodox understanding of the gospel. There was an orthodox understanding of the teachings of Christ. And Christ had led his apostles into these things, and they were teaching these things verbally. They were writing these things down. And so we should be cautious, and we should, I would argue, reject those who come along and claim to have new novel interpretations of Scripture that veer away from orthodox belief. Those who claim to have new special revelation, either in written form or direct from God. You see many cults who claim this kind of special revelation that is new and novel. Those who claim to have cracked the biblical code of prophecy and they can predict world events. In fact, they can even tell you the exact date of Christ's return new novel ways of seeing how the Bible fits together, new novel applications of Scripture, or new translations of words of Scripture that no one has understood until now. These things, and those who run after these things, ultimately end up preaching a different gospel. We should guard ourselves against those who in our day teach in this way and claim these things for themselves. It's not the exact word, but it's very similar. In the book of Galatians, Paul says a very similar thing. This is Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. He says to that church, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who calls you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. That word different gospel, it's very similar to this word that he uses for different doctrine. 
They're turning to a different gospel. And then he's quick to say, not that there is another one, that is, there's not really another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Paul has this sense of urgency both in the church, to the church in Galatia and here to Timothy to warn against these things. In fact, we see this urgency in that both in the book of Galatians and here in 1 Timothy, Paul skips his kind of usual niceties. Usual, usually his letters have a greeting. We looked at that last week. And then there's this section of thanksgiving, and then there's instruction. And Paul just kind of blows past the thanksgiving. He wants to get right to the instruction. There's a sense of urgency that he has, both for the church in Galatia and the church here in Ephesus, because there are those who are teaching novel, false doctrine that is different from the orthodox doctrine that Christ delivered through his apostles. At the heart of this, at the heart of their teaching, at the heart of this false doctrine, this different doctrine, is a devaluing of Christ as our hope and God as our Savior. That's how, why he emphasized this last week. He emphasized the truth that Jesus is our hope, that God is our Savior. And those who look to other things, other understandings of Scripture for true hope, for true salvation, must be rejected and corrected. There are those who want to reject the gift of salvation that comes by grace and mercy from God that gives us ultimate peace with God. There are those within the church who are looking to new, more advanced, more mysterious, more exciting things. And those who teach these things claim that it will result in an advanced godliness. Some even claim that that's where true salvation itself is to be found. So let's take a moment and look at these opponents, these false teachers. Now, it's interesting, as you read the pastoral epistles, I'm in agreement with those that would say that between these three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, either these false teachers are of all the same stripes or they're very similar. Either we're talking about one group here, or they are very, very similar just in the way that Paul talks about them. But the way that Paul talks about these false teachers, one New Testament scholar says he's, he's frustratingly vague. Like we want him to kind of name exactly what they were teaching and name exactly who they are. But unfortunately, we don't get a lot of details. You, you see, we're dealing with a letter that Paul's writing to Timothy, and Timothy knows the details, and it's being read in the church, and the church knows the details. They know who these certain persons are and what they're teaching. So there's this vagueness to the teaching, and ultimately, I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing because it enables this wider application for our context and other contexts. You see, if you were to be very specific about what the false teachers were teaching, you might say, well, I'm not teaching that or I don't believe that, and so this doesn't apply to me. But because he's a little bit vague, we have to look at the heart of the teaching, and we see that that has a wide application. You see, in these letters, we see more characteristics of these teachings than specifics. We see a picture of these false teachers. One of the clearest pictures we see is in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, we'll look at verse 3, and we'll read verses 4 and 5 as well. Again, Paul writes, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. And look at these characteristics of these opponents. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. We see these characteristics of these false teachers. And again, many of the qualifications for elders that we see in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, they're meant to counteract these negative qualifications of these false teachers. So just for example, these false teachers have this unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels. And one of the qualifications for elders is that they not be quarrelsome. We see these characteristics of these false teachers it's similar, the situation is similar in Crete in the book of Titus. 
we see in Titus chapter 3. Again, I think we're talking about either the same group or a very similar group. Titus chapter 3, verse 9. Paul to Titus this time says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. We see the characteristics of these false teachers and the seriousness with which Paul takes those who are teaching in this way, behaving in this way, stirring up division within the body of Christ through these novel ideas. We do see some specifics of this false teaching in 1 Timothy. So some specifics that we see, verse 4. That these folks, we see, verse 4, that they devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. We see in verse 6 that certain persons, by swerving from these, we'll explain the these here in a moment, have wandered away into vain discussions. They desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. We do see some specifics here. First, we see that whatever the teaching is, it seems to have a Jewish element to it. In Titus 1, verse 14, he calls them not just myths, but Jewish myths. We see the emphasis here on the law that specifically these false teachers, they're engaging in a misuse and misapplication of the law. We see in verse 6 that the false teaching, it revolves around vain, that is empty, endless, pointless discussions. Verse 4, it says that this false teaching, it revolves around myths and endless genealogies what are we talking about here well we're not exactly sure but we can take a guess right myths here myths are in the new testament are always used in a negative context these these myths these are always negative this is fanciful imagination these are false things that people are coming up with this emphasis on genealogies genealogies are these lists that we see in the old testament we see them in the gospels as well these lists of ancestors, these lists of so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. We see these lists of the people of God and their ancestry. And so what are we talking about here? What are these myths and endless genealogies? Well, we do have examples of later Jewish writings that would kind of dive into these Old Testament genealogies. They would seek to crack the code of these Uh, Old Testament genealogies, and they would create mythological biographies of obscure biblical figures found in these genealogies, and they would assert that true true enlightenment comes from understanding these things, understanding these myths that they make up about these biblical figures. What we have here is possibly an early form of that. But we do have this Lack of specificity. That's about all we get. And we'll see more of it as we continue through these letters. But what it forces us to do, again, is to look at the heart of these false teachers and their false teaching. So as we look through the pastoral epistles as a whole, again, assuming that we're talking about a similar group here in all three of these letters, we see that these false teachers and their false teaching, it downplays the work of Christ. It downplays the the work of Christ. It claims that true godliness comes from understanding these myths, from diving into these genealogies and these examples of these mythical biographies that they've come up with of these Old Testament figures. Downplays the gospel. Downplays the exclusiveness of Christ and the necessity of faith. These false teachers, they were sectarian. They rejected the inclusion of Gentiles into the people of God. This is one mark of false teaching. It tends to be very exclusive. We see that these false teachers, they reject the physical, physical matter, physical material, the physical world as good. They consider material things to be evil. And so they have harsh rules regarding food and drink. They forbid marriage because they don't value the physical. They see no need for a true physical resurrection of Christ. Instead, just a spiritual resurrection will do. This false teaching, it results in division within the church. It results in factions and gossip and slander. 
these false teachers and this false teaching, it brings reproach from outsiders. It doesn't result in what we saw in First Peter 2 a, a few weeks ago, that they're not keeping their conduct honorable among outsiders. There's no one looking at the church in Ephesus and these false teachers and saying, there's something appealing about the hope and the joy and the unity that they have in Christ. And I have this draw to learn more about the gospel so that I might come to know Christ and glorify God along with them. That's lacking here because of the reproach that has come from outsiders because of the false teaching. The results of this false teaching in the teachers and those who adhere to it is immorality. We also see that it is led by those who want to be teachers. They want to be leaders. They want to be pastors. But not for good reasons. They want to be pastors and teachers and leaders for the prestige and the profit rather than the faithfulness of God, rather than carrying out the stewardship that is from God. The heart of this, the heart of these teachers and the heart of this teaching, we see in 1 Timothy 1.4 at the end, where we see that these endless genealogies, these myths that promote speculation, they do these things rather than the stewardship from God, which is by faith. This is the heart of this. These things, they produce nothing of value. Diving into these things, speculating about these things, teaching these things, they promote nothing of value. They do not promote the stewardship from God, which is by faith. You see that in verse 4. All of these things do not promote the stewardship from God that is by faith. What are we talking about here? The word stewardship here, it can mean administration or plan. This is God's administration or plan. This stewardship that from God, it, that is from God, it amounts to God's plan of salvation administered and accomplished by Christ and appropriated by faith. We're talking about the gospel here. God's plan of salvation accomplished by Christ that is appropriated by faith. This is what we've been given as the people of God. This is the message we've been given. This is our hope. This is why we have hope in Jesus. This is the hope that we have. This is the hope that we are called to proclaim. And the folks who are engaging in these things, these distractions, these pointless conversations, these claims of higher knowledge and deeper spirituality, they're distracting from the hope that we have in Christ seen in the gospel. They are distracting from the mission that we have to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. You see, this is what every Christian, especially pastors, should devote themselves to. Instead, Paul is confronting those, and we see those in our day, who instead devote themselves to silly speculation, novel interpretations of the Bible, higher level spirituality through secret knowledge. what we should devote ourselves to, what Timothy is going to urge these false teachers to devote themselves to, is instead God's salvation accomplished by Christ. We are called to steward that gift, that gift of salvation that we have in Christ. We are called to steward that gift well by proclaiming it to others. The correction that Paul gives to Timothy is certainly relevant for this church in Ephesus, but it's relevant for every church at every time, especially ours. We live in a day where divisive, speculative, novel, so-called biblical teaching is rampant. It's nothing new, but it's, it's especially rampant. It lives on the internet, social media, YouTube, podcasts, self-proclaimed pastors and teachers those who promise secret knowledge. Devotion to these things results in entertainment, but ultimately spiritual atrophy and division in the church. I bring up this next point cautiously, and I do so, I, I trust before the Lord, out of love for you and a, a genuine desire to see you 
steward the gift of God well, to steward the gospel well. My desire is for us to steward the mission that God has given us well. So I say this out of love. I am not picking on anyone. I'm not trying to pile on. I'm not trying to heap guilt upon you. But there's a a pretty large consensus among the commentators and those who talk about this text that this has a particular application for the rise that we see of those who embrace foolish conspiracy theories. We talked about this when we talked about Proverbs and what does it mean to listen well? What does it mean to listen with discernment? The rise of foolish conspiracy theories, especially those that attach Bible verses as support. These things appeal to our pride because they promise secret knowledge, right? This it appeals to our desire to be in the know. These things, they can feel exciting. Engaging in these kinds of conspiracy theories, you know, online, you know, debating about these things and talking to people about them and trying to evangelize for these causes, right? It can feel exciting. It can feel like you're really doing something. It can feel like you're achieving a more exciting mission than the one we've been given by Christ. If you found yourself, and I would include myself here, if you found yourself intrigued, pulled into these types of things, you found yourself devoted to these things, you found yourself evangelizing for these things, maybe on the other end of those things, take a look back and ask yourself, what was really accomplished for the cause of Christ by engaging in those things? What was the result? Did it result in a greater love for Jesus, greater love and unity within the church? Did it Did it really result in those outside the church seeing our joy and unity and love in Christ and saying, there's something about that that I have to have? Or did it result in pride, division, foolish speculation, and ultimately distraction from the real mission that Jesus has given us, that Jesus has given you? The mission that we all have to promote God's plan of salvation, accomplished by Jesus, received by faith. How can we guard ourselves against these things? Because this is what we should consider as we see Timothy's correction of these false teachers. We should ask ourselves, how can we guard ourselves from teaching these things ourselves or being pulled into these kinds of things? Maybe we can ask the more general question, how does someone fall into this kind of speculative teaching? Verse 5, we see, and I think verse 5 is key. Paul writes this. He says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is the verse that I really latched on to this week because it's, it's very instructive for me and my approach, not just to preaching this message, but I hope my preaching in general. You see, he says that the aim of our charge is love. You're like, what aim? What charge? What's he talking about? Well, the charge here, the aim of our charge, the charge, it's referring back to verse 3, the, the charge that Timothy was to give to certain persons not to teach this false doctrine. And so what's the goal of this? What's the goal of Timothy's correction of these false teachers? What should be the goal of our correction of brothers or sisters in Christ who are straying into false and strange doctrine that are proclaiming something other than salvation in Jesus. What should be our goal? Our goal in this correction is love. Timothy's goal for these false teachers is ultimately loving them by correcting them. In our day, that's a hard thing to to hold together. That loving someone sometimes means correcting them. The goal for Timothy, for these false teachers, is love. His goal is that these false teachers might repent, that they might turn back to the hope that they have in Jesus, and that the result would be a deeper love for God and a deeper love for their neighbor that results from true faith 
in Jesus. This is the goal for Timothy to these false teachers, and this is the general goal of Paul's teaching, and this is the goal for us as we look at this text that the result of these things might be a more sincere faith, an unwavering faith in Jesus that results in love, love for God and love for one another. We see in verse 5 that this love, it comes from something. This love comes from something. It comes from three things. This love, it's, we see it, it issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is where this kind of love comes from. This is what Timothy wants these false teachers to turn to, perhaps turn back to, or perhaps just turn to in a genuine way for the first time. That this love for God and others, it comes from a pure heart that is a, a heart that has been cleansed by the work of Christ. That is a heart that can stand pure before God, not because of our own good works, but because of Christ's obedience on our behalf. That can stand pure, cleansed before God because Christ has died in our place for the penalty of our sin. He has risen from the grave and He now offers to us new life. He offers to us a pure heart before God. The reception of this kind of pure heart that comes through faith in Jesus that results in love for God and love for for others, this love results from a good conscience. We're going to talk more about this idea of conscience. It, it's a, a theme that we see quite a bit in these pastoral epistles. Let me just say, uh, your conscience is that internal barometer of right and wrong. It's that internal feeling of right or wrong, guilt or innocence. What we see in this, this good conscience that produces love this good conscience is ultimately a clean conscience. It's a clean conscience. This is freedom from guilt that is accomplished objectively by Christ. He's the one that makes you guiltless. And it is felt subjectively. This good conscience is felt subjectively as we walk in obedience to Christ. And all these things come from a sincere faith that is trusting truly in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. The goal is that they would return to this. They would return to this from which they have strayed. You see, these false teachers have strayed from these things. They've trusted from a sincere tr faith in Jesus. More likely, they claim to have faith in Jesus, but they, they never did. They've strayed away from the gospel of Jesus. We see in verse 6 that certain persons, again, Timothy knows who they are. They know who they are. Certain persons by swerving from these things. What things? These, this pure heart, this good conscience, this sincere faith in Christ. They have swerved from these things and as a result have wandered away into vain discussion. We see that they have wandered away from these things. They've wandered away from sincere trust in Christ. They have violated or seared their conscience, we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4. That is that convicting work of the Holy Spirit, right? They've ignored that. The conviction that they see from God's Word, they've ignored that and they've seared over their conscience to the point where they no longer feel guilt for the sin that they engage in. What we see here is that false teaching, teaching false things, teaching a false gospel, embracing a false gospel, embracing false hope, before it is an intellectual problem, it is a moral problem. You see, those who have strayed into intellectual objections started by giving into sinful desires. They started by going against conscience, by rejecting the clear teaching of Scripture. I'm going on 17 years in, in some form of ministry within the church, and I've seen, sadly, in this church and in other churches. Clear examples of this. Those who have walked away from the faith. Now, what do I believe about those people? I believe that they never truly knew Christ. They appear to. But they went out from us, as John says in 1 John 2, so that it might be clear that they were not ultimately of us. But how does this happen? The examples and the painful, specific examples of people I know who have walked away from faith in Christ. 
who are active participants within a local church, who claim to have genuine faith in Christ, who claim to have this sincere faith where they were trusting in God for a pure heart and they had this good, clear conscience and they would follow the precepts of Scripture and they claim to be led by the Holy Spirit and then they end up rejecting these things. They end up rejecting, as Pastor John said earlier, the authority of Scripture. Maybe this isn't really God's Word to us. They end up rejecting the moral commands of Scripture. You know, yeah, like, God says this, but society's kind of moved past that, right? They end up doubting things like these false teachers, the, the physical resurrection, this idea that Christ will return physically. They end up rejecting things like the deity of Christ and other things. How do these things start? How does someone fall into these things? Well, I think the example we have here and the example that I've seen is that these things rarely start as intellectual objections. They usually start as moral problems. You see, what happens is someone within the church begins to be tempted by the things of this world. They begin to buy into the lie that true hope is found in the pleasures of this world, the pursuits of this world. And they have a conscience that is saying, no, that's not the way God has called you to live and walk. And so they have this conviction against those things, but they, they give in to those things. And they have this overwhelming sense of guilt. There's things they want to pursue, but they have this innate sense of guilt because they know they're engaging in things that God calls sinful. And so they have a choice. They can turn from those things turn to God in repentance and faith and find their hearts purified, find their consciences cleansed and renewed, or just like the serpent in Genesis 3, they can say, well, did God really say that? A sure way to ignore your conscience, sear your conscience, is to question God's really said anything meaningful at all. If God's really said what he's claimed to say, if Jesus really is who he claims to be, if hell is even real, if sin is even a category we should have anymore. Those that I have sat with and pleaded with who have walked into these things, they, they feel a sense of freedom at first. Right? Because they're, they're burdened by this sense of guilt, but then there is no God and he hasn't really told us how to live and there's no real salvation in Christ and we can just kind of do what we want, well, there's a sense of false freedom, but this freedom ends in destruction. And so before I would warn you against embracing false teaching, advancing false teaching, dabbling in speculative doctrines and divisive discussions that distract from the mission of Jesus, I would first call you to where these things begin. And I say this with deep love for you, but deep concern for you. Be aware of the deceitfulness of sin. Listen to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that He accomplishes through God's Word, that He accomplishes through your brothers and sisters in Christ, that He accomplishes through your pastors who want to bring God's Word before you and call you to repentance. My fear is that it will seem small, because it will, You'll say in your heart, you will sear over your conscience, you will reject God's word, and you'll say, it's just, a, it's just a little stance of pride, what could hurt? It's just a little dabbling in sinful pleasure, it's not hurting anyone. It's just a small escape of comfort, it's just this one deceitful pursuit of power. Sin is deceptive. These men that Paul stood before in Acts 20, 
these men, these leaders, these, this church in Ephesus. He told them it would happen, and then it did. What we see is that chapter 1, verse 19, about these false teachers, that by rejecting this, and that is the gospel, by rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. I know there are those in this room who are battling severe temptation even this morning. You are engaging in things that you never thought you would engage in. Things that you may have felt bad about a year ago, two years ago, but now your conscience is seared over. As you continue to engage in these things, you may make a shipwreck of your faith. Let me say to pastors, future pastors, fathers, those who have been put in a position of leading churches and families, the damage will not just come to you, but it will come to those who God has entrusted to you. And so my appeal to you this morning comes from a place of love, that if you find yourself veering off into these things that promise secret knowledge, that promise greater joy, that promise a way to look at things that justify sinful behavior in your life, while it's still called today, and while God is giving you the grace, would you repent? Would you turn back to God? Would you confess your sin before Him? And would you reaffirm a sincere faith in Jesus? It is because of his work that your heart is cleansed. It is because of his work that you have peace with God. Those who have bought into the lie that hope and salvation could be found in some pursuit of this world. Well, it's still called today. Find your hope only in Jesus. I want to take a moment to give you the opportunity to go before the Lord and do just that, to... Repent of things that perhaps you've been giving yourself to. Confess things that you have been giving your mind to. Confess things that you've been engaging in that has resulted in sin in your own life or division within the body of Christ. It's good before we come to this meal of communion that we take a moment to examine ourselves and ask yourself, do I have a sincere faith in Jesus? And as a result, am I stewarding well the gift that he's given me by faith. Take a moment to go before the Lord, confess what the Spirit leads you to confess, and then I will read this word of assurance to you whose faith is in Christ, and we will take communion together.
hear this word of assurance. This is from 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Paul says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. As we confess our sin before God, as we confess our tendency to trust in the things of this world, as we confess our tendency to stand on pride and trust in our own reasoning apart from God, we lay these things down before him, delighting in the full forgiveness of sin that we have in Jesus. Delighting in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for the penalty of all of our sin, including the sin that you just confessed before him. And because of that work, those who believe in him have eternal life. Those who believe in him have a pure heart, a clean conscience, because of the sincere faith that he has given you in Jesus. We're going to celebrate that work now through this meal of communion. In this meal, we see and remember that though Jesus lived a perfect life, the life that we should have lived but do not, he died a substitutionary death in our place for the penalty of our sin. His body was broken and his blood was shed, not for his sin. He had none. It was for our sin. It was for my sin. It was for your sin. And so if your trust is in Jesus this morning, you have a sincere faith in the work of Christ, I'd invite you to come forward, take a piece of the bread, take the cup, take it back to your seat, and we will celebrate this remembrance of the work of Christ together. If you're not a Christian, if you're hoping in something other than Christ for your salvation, for your hope, my encouragement to you is not to trust in this meal. It will do nothing for you. Instead, turn from trusting and the idols of your life, the worthless pursuits of your life, and find your trust in Jesus and his work. Let me pray for us, and then we'll participate together. Father, we thank you for this warning that we see. We know that this warning comes because you love us. These warnings are one of the means that you use to keep us, to preserve us, to enable us to persevere in the faith. Lord, that perseverance comes as a gift of your grace. We can take no credit for it. And so we thank you for the ability to continue in belief, the ability to keep clinging to you and the hope that we have in you. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who does not know you, who is trusting in some other thing for their salvation. Would they see the worthlessness of those things and would they turn and trust in you, Jesus? I pray for brothers and sisters in Christ in this room who perhaps find themselves pulled away by these fleeting pleasures, these promises, these false promises of temptation. Lord, I pray for those who find themselves trapped right now. Lord, would you reveal your grace to them? Would you enable them to lay those things before you and to reaffirm their faith and trust in you? Lord, I pray for anyone here who is deceived, who has bought into things that promise life where there is no life. Lord, we pray against division within this church that comes from hoping in things and trusting in things that are less than you. Lord, protect us from these things. Lord, I pray for myself and for the pastors of this church, for future pastors. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to lead this body well, to do so out of love, to do so in full reliance upon you. Lord, I, I see in these letters a, a deep awareness of my own inadequacy. I need you, your help. I need your spirit to enable me for these things. And so I pray for that. Lord, I pray that now as we worship you, that you might be glorified as we express our hope that is placed only in you. And I pray that we would steward this gift well and proclaim the hope that we have in you to a watching world. I pray the most evident things about our lives would be the deep love we have for one another and the deep hope that we have in you, Jesus. Help us with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
On the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the work of Christ until we see him again face to face. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this tangible reminder of Jesus and what he has accomplished for us. Lord, I pray that with a sincere faith that we might all be trusting in Jesus and his work for a pure heart and a clean conscience before you. Lord, I pray that we would hold to that 
truth unswervingly. Lord, enable us to spot false gospels, false hopes, things that promise life where there is no life. Lord, I pray that this church would be known for a church that truly is centered on the gospel. We talk about gospel centrality often. Would it not just be a buzzword or a label? Would it be a true reality in each of our lives? That our lives might be centered on the hope that we have in you, Jesus. I pray that as a result, that we might experience the unity of the gospel within this church. We might experience the life-giving power of the gospel as we see more and more people coming to know you, not for the name of this church, but for your name, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that it is for that name that we would now sing, glorifying you, expressing our hope in you, and delighting in the salvation that comes from you by faith. We'll be glorified now in our singing and be glorified in our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, you'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word. to the Israelites. 
Lord, how time and time again, despite their disobedience, despite how they look to other things for their comfort, despite their grumbling, despite their complaining, Lord, you remained faithful to your promise to your people. And today you continue to remain faithful to the promise you have for your people. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, forgive us of ways that we have been unfaithful. Forgive us of ways that we have looked to other things. Help us to turn, repent, and look to you, Lord, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who goes before us, who leads the way, Lord. Help us to trust you, to look to you, and to know that you are our God and our King who remains faithful, who remains true. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Oh, and I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. He'll never let me down. Great is your faith. you this morning. You are great and faithful. Thank you that while we may shake, we may not be faithful, we can depend on you, our rock, our firm foundation, our mighty fortress that will ever be faithful. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. have a few announcements for you before we part ways. I keep trying to find subtle ways to join the worship team, like coming up here early, um, and Matt just doesn't let it happen. I'll, I'll try again next time. We'll see what happens. Um, for those of you that are new to Gospel Life Church or just have been visiting a few times, one of the ways that we uh, maintain community and communication with you all is through the church app. And so uh, if you haven't had a chance to download that, I want to encourage you to visit uh, you know, the Google Play Store, the uh, Apple Store, download that app, and uh, it's called the Church app. Search for Gospel Life Church, and then just make that your home church. And in that way, you can stay uh, just connected with any news that we have, any upcoming events. Um, there's a place for next steps if you're interested in attending a, a coffee with the pastors, which I'll talk about in a moment, or gospel communities, any of those things. So it's just a, a great communication tool that we plan to utilize more and more and more here at Gospel Life Church. So if you haven't downloaded that, please take a moment to do so. Coming up in a couple of Sundays on March 21st will be our next Coffee with the Pastors. Uh, what this is, is this is an event that we have uh, for recent attendees of Gospel Life Church. It's a time to sit down uh, with some of the pastors of Gospel Life Church to talk about our mission, to talk about our values, to talk about our discipleship strategy, to get to know you and for you to get to know us. And so just a great first event uh, to come to if you're newer to Gospel Life Church. So again, that'll be coming up on Sunday, March 21st at 1 p.m. We give you a little bit of time to go out and grab lunch and then come back here. Um, and it's just a really great time, and we really enjoy being able to be a part of these. So you may RSVP for that on the church app if you are interested in attending. Uh, also, we have an announcement for you as it regards um, the mask mandate. Uh, so 
Keeping in line with uh, Governor Abbott's announcement, uh, as many of you may have heard already, on Wednesday he will be lifting uh, the mask mandate uh, statewide for the state of Texas. And so in not wanting to put a burden on our people that exceeds that of what is being asked of businesses and um, in the community at large around us, uh, the elders of Gospel Life Church have decided to lift the requirement to wear masks um, to participate and come to our Sunday gatherings. Um, so that'll be effective next Sunday. Uh, with that, we are still trying to be wise about what we do. And so we want you to know that as it regards our Sunday gatherings, we're going to keep doing communion in the same manner that we have. Uh, we're going to continue to refrain from the passing of the peace at this point. Even if you'll look around this Sunday, you'll notice that there's a lot of people sitting next to you. And so we just want to be wise of that. For you, we would ask you to just to be even more vigilant of your own physical symptoms. If there's anything that you're feeling to please being that we're um, lifting this mandate, if you are feeling any of the symptoms that are related to COVID-19, that you stay home and that you be mindful of that. And of those that are around you, your brothers and sisters in Christ, we ask that you would also just continue to be aware of the personal boundaries of others. Um, there's different feelings and different comfort levels with this. And so just pay special attention to that and try and love and care for those around you by picking up on those subtle cues that might help you interact in a more loving way with one another. Uh, we will do our best. Um, to provide KN95 masks uh, here on Sunday mornings, which offer a better personal protection to those who decide to continue to choose to wear face coverings as they attend. We want to, if that is your desire and your choice, to encourage you to continue to do that. And uh, we want to endeavor to make everybody feel welcomed and safe and at home here as best as we can. So we want to provide those um, and have those here uh, at the facilities for you uh, so that you can make use of those. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to Pastor Tyler, to myself, to Pastor Jonathan. We'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, we understand that there is still some risk in making this decision. Uh, our heart behind this is wanting to worship in the way that we knew it a year ago um, and wanting you to feel free of any burden that wearing face coverings has placed on you at the same time being mindful of those who still have concern over this. And so we ask that your heart might follow in that same suit as you love and care for one another. An additional update, uh, you may have noticed we're missing some ceiling tiles in here. If you haven't been in the past week or two, everybody's looking up now. <laughs> okay, everybody back up, focus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, um, a few weeks ago we experienced flooding uh, with um, just the freezing temperatures that we had. We had uh, several pipes burst, and so um, that has created an opportunity for us to do some renovations here at the church. And so uh, just as far as what's happening at the moment, uh, we have a contractor who is out. They are working on taking up carpeting uh, upstairs, and we'll soon do that downstairs, uh, taking out ceiling tiles and eventually probably sheetrock that has been damaged, uh, re-insulating and, and doing those types of things. And so there is uh, some construction underway, and we hope to uh, update our facilities a little bit during this time. Um, and to be able to um, just make them look nicer with regard to uh, some of the finances that we might receive as a part of that insurance claim. And so um, just using this as an opportunistic thing. Um, so with that, we also are just in the process of getting our insurance claim processed. And so we've heard from our adjuster. Um, we're waiting to receive a report from him, and uh, that'll give us a better picture of the finance from week to week. But we're going to endeavor to continue to meet here on uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, you can see we're going for a little bit of an industrial look. We're going to leave the scaffolding in place. We think it adds a nice touch. Um, it, extra seating, it's great. Um, Lastly, I'd like to uh, uh, just mention that we brought on a new individual part-time. Um, we have decided to bring on Matt Oakes as our Director of Communications. Um, Matt and his family moved to New Braunfels at the beginning of the year. Um, Pastor Tyler and I and Pastor John have gotten to know him. We really enjoy Matt. Um, he has a like-mindedness in, um, I think, I just our philosophy of ministry, our heart for the Lord how we would like to see discipleship occur here in Go at Gospel Life Church. And he also just has giftings that uh, we feel like would complement ours really well. Um, we are starting Matt off in a, a part-time role, but we're hopeful that the Lord turns that into more and that Matt is able to participate more and more here, at the work, uh, here in the work of Gospel Life Church. Um, Matt has a master's degree from Redeemer Seminary and uh, was the former pastor of worship and missional communities at Center Church in Brenham. So I'm going to invite Matt up. Uh, you can give him a round of applause there. 
just to tell you a little bit about himself, his family, and uh, what he likes about Gospel Life Church and his desire to be a part. So. Well, good morning. Uh, like Jesse said, my name's Matt Oaks. Uh, my wife, Joni, is back there in the uh, blue shirt. And then we've got three kids, uh, Bella, Imogen, and Noah. Also, I, uh, my mother is Melanie Oaks, so just so y'all know, I'm, I'm proud of that. And then that makes Natalie my sister, so um, just so y'all know how I'm related here. Which um, makes us brother-in-law. Yes. So oh, yeah, you're my brother-in-law. So don't get con confused. That yeah. one has a beard, mine has a scrub. Yeah, and it's okay to call me Oaks. He was here first. He can be Matt. That's fine. Um, we're really excited uh, to be here, to be part of Gospel Life. Um, starting in August, we, Joni and I started sensing that God was calling us to some sort of transition in our life, and turned out that meant moving in the middle of a pandemic um, home. Uh, New Braunfels is where I'm from, and um, it's been a really uh, just great work of God for him to draw us here. And and as we sense that we were being drawn to New Braunfels, um, you know, we feel strongly that where, where we are part of a church family is the most important thing in that transition, where, you know, it's more important to us than where kids end up at school or jobs or those kind of things. And, and so we started here because we had family here, and we'd seen how uh, God had used gospel life to grow, to bless our family, and, and that's what attracted us here first. And um, as, as we, you know, kind of explored things and I got to know your pastors better and better, we just sense that this is where God is calling us as a family um, to serve God together, to follow God, to grow in the gospel together. So I'm really excited uh, to be church family with you, to serve the Lord um, with you, and I'm excited for this opportunity to help uh, our church grow as we communicate with one another and as we communicate um, to the city outside of us. And so um, thank you for welcoming us. We're really excited to be here, and yeah, that's, that's all I got. Thanks, Matt. Uh, just quickly, for those of you that are here in person and joining us online, I always want to remind you of our connection cards. And so if you can take a few moments after service to fill those out, if there's uh, any prayer requests that you have, any next steps that you're interested in, there's those gold connection cards in a, uh, underneath the seat in front of you. Or for those of you joining us online, we have our online connection card form. Uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Jonathan up here to give us our benediction this morning. Uh, well, Gospel Life and visitors, uh, it's been a joy to worship with you this morning. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, um, after the service, if you are a visitor, we'd love to meet and introduce ourselves to you. We'll be a me, myself and Pastor Tyler will be up front to do that. Or if you'd like uh, to pray with one of us, we'll be available for that as well. And so I'd encourage you, uh, if you need prayer, please don't leave without coming up and praying with us. It is an honor, a privilege to pray with you, uh, to go before the Lord in that way. And so uh, as we dismiss, would you stand with me? I would send you with uh, the words of Paul to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians, uh, which is God's word to us today. So Gospel Life Church, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole soul, spirit, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. May God bless you, and we hope you join us next week. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, Now you're new, but... Oh, yeah. Oh, it's only three houses down from where you are now? Oh, awesome. Okay. Sometimes that makes it harder, though, because you don't really pass. You just have to, like, carry it up. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's good. Hi, hey, brother. How are you? I know why you like that. I always just see you. Why is that? Too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We just hired a, a thinner, uh, better-looking version of me. So. <laughs>